There is something special about time lapses of the night sky like this one, besides the undoubted beauty of the sky itself. We can also enjoy the beauty of engineering, looking at some of the most powerful astronomical instruments in the world. And for me personally, there is also the fact that I've never seen that sky. Not in the sense that you just can't see the sky with your own eyes the same way cameras see it. Both instruments on those time lapses, VLT and ALMA, are located in the Atacama Desert in Chile. That's the sky of the Southern Hemisphere. And I, and probably many of you, live in the Northern Hemisphere. I haven't seen many of Southern stars and constellations, but most importantly, I haven't seen this. These are Magellanic Clouds dwarf galaxies visible with the naked eye from the southern hemisphere, satellites of the Milky Way. So planets have satellites, and planets are satellites of stars, galaxies also have satellites. It might appear as if our galaxy has very few satellites. Even some planets have dozens and dozens of moons. But obviously the Milky Way has a lot more than just two satellites. Magellanic clouds are just the ones that are known best. And probably we haven't even discovered all of them. And yet, there still could be not enough of them. And that is the missing satellite problem. Lambda CDM model is the current standard cosmological model. It is very successful and describes very well the evolution of the universe and how it works. And even this model has, let's say, some inconsistencies with observations. Scientists have been trying to solve those problems and figure out whether the trouble is with theory or observations. The missing satellite problem is one of those major inconsistencies. In short, the thing is that cosmological simulations that, in other aspects, very well recreated the structure and evolution of the universe predicted that a Milky Way-like galaxy should have hundreds or even thousands of dwarf galaxies. But in practice we observe tens of satellites at best. So what's the deal? Will we have to ditch one of the most successful fundamental theories and simulations are wrong? Or galaxies are actually there, but we can't see them? Or could they have disappeared? Let's talk about all of this and more. My name is Andre, and this is Cosmos Elementary. So simulations showed a certain result. While in reality we saw a completely different story. The obvious thought is, simulations might be wrong. Actually, some people don't take seriously anything that's modeled or made with computers. And some people take it to the extreme and claim that there are no real images of Earth simply because some photos are edited for various reasons. But you shouldn't underestimate simulations. Even models like Universe and Box, which is basically just a game which follows some laws of classical Newtonian physics, can be somewhat accurate. If we take two large bodies of a certain mass, they would behave more or less like they would in real life on short time scale. That would even work for more than two bodies. Even the solar system, to a certain extent, works like it should. We can't even predict where a certain body would be and what would happen to it. And Universe Sandbox takes a home PC to run it. But actual scientific simulations of large-scale structure of the universe, such as Millennium, Fire, Vela, Illustris, Blue Tides and others, that is a completely different story. They contain tens of millions to hundreds of billions of elements or particles. They take supercomputers to run them. Some of those simulations are relatively new, and even they have their limitations. They model different periods and focus on different aspects of cosmic evolution. Some model only dark matter and galaxies are added afterwards. Some focus on evolution of separate galaxies, and others on the evolution of the universe. So this field has been developing for decades. In the past, simulations tried to catch up with reality. Scientists attempted to recreate what we actually see in the cosmos. Modern simulations already begin to have some predicting power. We actually gain new information about the universe with their help. They not only accurately recreate the large-scale structure of the universe, the cosmic web, that we can actually see in surveys like Sloan Digital Sky Survey, but also simulations allow scientists to test theories, make predictions that later get confirmed or refuted by observations. The thing is that this problem didn't occur yesterday. It first appeared decades ago when simulations weren't as good and lots of factors could have been ignored. So on the one hand, simulations are a very important instrument, and on the other hand, they are still not perfect, and obviously they were worse in the past. 
Before we begin with the solutions to this problem, let's talk about halos. Not this halo, these halos. Dark matter halos. You might have heard that the halo is a part of the galactic structure. The current understanding is that the part of our galaxy that is made of regular baryonic matter, the spiral disk of stars, gas and dust, and also some globular clusters are surrounded by a huge halo of dark matter. It's a very important component of the Milky Way and it is way more massive than stars and gas combined and it determines evolution and motions of stars in the galaxy. Obviously, not only the Milky Way has such a halo, and what is more, there could be even just halos with no galaxies in them. There can be halos of different sizes and also sub-halos. As some of you might know, small fluctuations in the early universe led to formation of regions of non-uniform density. Dark matter formed structure and massive dark matter halos attracted regular matter that became galaxies. Here, orange is dark matter halos, blue is a bridge of dark matter between halos and white is regular gas where galaxies are forming. So halos are structures of dark matter. We can say that regular matter, in the form of stars, gas and dust, forms galaxies. And dark matter forms halos. And of course, there is an evolutionary link between them. The reason I mentioned halos is because it would be better to say that model showed the shortage of sub-halos and not galaxies. Smaller halos that are basically satellites of the more massive, larger halo, like the one that surrounds our galaxy. So perhaps simulations are not wrong, and there are actually a lot more dark matter sub-halos. There are just no visible galaxies in them. But as it usually goes, there isn't one simple answer. One of possible solutions is that actually there is no discrepancy between simulations and observations. And yes, I'm mostly talking about the Milky Way as an example, because it's in many ways easier to study. Perhaps we just haven't found all of the satellite galaxies. For instance, in the earlier studies that mentioned the missing satellite problem, you can find the following numbers. About 10 satellite dwarf galaxies of the Milky Way and about 40 galaxies in the local group. Some of the dwarf galaxies in the local group are satellites of Andromeda Galaxy. But that was more than 20 years ago. Since then, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, or SDSS, has discovered about 20 more galaxies. And DES, or Dark Energy Survey, about 20 more. So with this, there are already about 50 satellite galaxies of the Milky Way, and SDSS and DES are not the only instruments discovering new galaxies. Another one is Gaia Telescope. In 2018, it discovered a quite large galaxy in the constellation of Antli. The galaxy was named Antli 2. And in 2019, Subaru Telescope discovered Boötes 4 galaxy. So now we can make several conclusions. SDSS and DES aren't observing the whole sky. SDSS covers about a third of the sky and DES just a tenth. Looking only at the area of the sky they surveyed is just a part of it. Also, those surveys obviously have other limitations. Dwarf galaxies are small and dim, and there are certain limits of the distance and brightness up to which those instruments can detect galaxies. So if we account for all of that, we realize that those surveys studied only a small fraction of the volume where Milky Way satellites could be. The situation should improve when LSST or Vera Rubin Telescope begins observations, hopefully in 2023. Perhaps it will discover even more satellite galaxies. Also, the two recently discovered galaxies I've mentioned give us some interesting information. Those are ultra-diffuse galaxies. This is a photograph of a different galaxy of this type. It's NGC 1052 DF2, a barely visible see-through blob. You can easily see other galaxies through it. Antle 2 is a relatively big galaxy and it's comparable in size with the Large Magellanic Cloud. So we basically have just discovered a large nearby galaxy. And the reason for that is, while similar in size with the Large Magellanic Cloud, it's 4000 times dimmer. So it's quite difficult to detect even large galaxies, because some of them are too dim. So the idea is that the discrepancy occurs because we are limited in what we can observe and detect in space. Galaxies are actually there, we just can't see them. There are even articles with bold names like this. There is no missing satellite problem. Oh, okay then, like and subscribe. All right. And that's not the only article like that one. And they account for various factors. But this article says that accounting for galaxies that we haven't yet detected, the Milky Way can have up to 200 satellites. 
As you might guess from reading the name of the study, it says that taking everything into account, the number of satellites and simulations should match what we actually see. Hence, there is no problem. So, cool. But that's not all. I've mentioned various factors. And what about dark halos without galaxies? By the way, there are a couple more ideas. So, if a theory and observations don't coincide, there is something wrong with either theory or observations. Or both. So, I've talked about attempts to solve the problem through observations, but there are other possible solutions. Using different models for dark matter and even exotic physics could solve the problem. But as I've said, the modern standard cosmological model is so successful that exotic physics is perhaps the last place to go to. There is another factor I haven't mentioned. The mass of the Milky Way is not known very precisely. The higher estimate is bigger by a factor of two than the lower one. So if the real mass is closer to the lower estimate, it significantly decreases the number of required satellites in simulations. So this can at least mitigate the problem. Ok, let's suppose that initially there were hundreds of dark matter subhalos bound to the Milky Way. Some of them could have stayed dark without ever forming galaxies. Some halos could be not massive enough to create cold gas to form stars and also there could be processes that don't allow stars and galaxies to form. For instance, photoionization. A process where photons ionize atoms and molecules of gas. We know that massive bright stars can destroy with their radiation most of the molecular cloud where they formed. So they formed and then don't let others do the same. Pretty selfish. Even radiation from the Milky Way at a certain distance can affect gas and hold star formation. There is another option. Dark matter subhalos could have started forming stars, but then this happened. Supernova. One of the most powerful events in the universe. When a single star goes supernova, it can outshine the entire galaxy. And what such a powerful phenomenon can do to a small galaxy if one happens in it? In large galaxies, supernovae can also affect star formation, basically blowing away material needed for stars to form. So for a small young galaxy, such an explosion can be catastrophic. It can basically blow the gas away and hold star formation, so the galaxy wouldn't reach its maturity. So in a sense, a death of one star can kill the whole galaxy. So there could be galaxies that basically disappeared. Perhaps if we accounted for factors like these, it could solve the problem. As I've mentioned, some simulations model only dark matter and they don't account for star formation and supernovae. But now computers are much more powerful. Simulation resolution is vastly increased and scientists can account for more factors. And that's what they've actually done. One of the simulations I've mentioned, FIRE and LATTE project, also included equations that described supernovae. And simulations showed that supernovae did affect evolution of small galaxies. They basically didn't let many of them form. As a result, there were much fewer satellite galaxies, not thousands or even hundreds. So according to the authors of that study, when the model is more realistic and more processes are accounted for, the problem may be solved. And that's not all. We also have to remember that galaxies interact with each other. For instance, the Milky Way probably consumed several smaller galaxies. So now we can say that even if something is going to fundamentally change our understanding of the universe, it is not the missing satellites problem. Sure, it used to be one of the biggest problems of Lambda CDM model, but it's not anymore. The observations get better, new galaxies are discovered. By the way, there are also some new studies involving other galaxies instead of the Milky Way, and there the problem also didn't seem to exist. And at the same time, models and simulations get more complicated, they account for more factors. But if for some reason you get upset that the standard cosmological model is still strong, don't worry. There are some more problems, which we might talk about in future videos. Thanks for watching! Links to all of the sources are down below in the description. And if you enjoyed the video, leave a like, comment, and subscribe. Bye!